am so excited to be here with you today and this evening. It's an absolutely gorgeous area of the country, um, an area I've never been, and it's it's beautiful. I had the opportunity to work with some children, um, some of your amazing, really impressive children this afternoon, and that was a thrill. And now I'm happy to be here with you. So we're going to talk first about perfectionism, and as you can see by the subtitle, it really is one of the occupational hazards of working with or parenting gifted youth. And whether it is nature or nurture, um, or a complex interdependence of the two that creates cognitive giftedness, either way, they got it from somewhere. And what I find when I talk with parents about these issues with their gifted children, almost always at least one parent will come up to me afterwards and say, wow, that is me. And so I know that many of you will have been dealing with or have dealt in the past with some of these issues yourself. So let me oops, get my little old school thing here. There we go. The truth is, is that this quote, and you're seeing the first half of it right here, that try as hard as we may for perfection, the net result of our labors is an amazing variety of imperfectness. We are surprised at our own versatility and being able to fail in so many different ways. This is the core of what the issue with perfectionism is, which is that no matter how hard we try to be perfect, we never will be perfect. In fact, the attempt to be perfect is essentially the only thing you're guaranteed to fail at. And yet, in dealing with the cognitively gifted, it's almost always on their agenda. But there are different faces of perfection. Perfectionism doesn't always look the same in every child. And so there are a couple of couple of researchers who've done some work with it, and this is how they describe different kinds of perfectionists within the gifted realm. The first kind are the academic overachievers. They feel like if they don't get 100%, the world will end. These are the kids who get a 98 on an assignment, and then they go to the teacher after class and say, do you give extra credit? Right? These are, they have to get 100 all the time. They're not satisfied without it. Then you have aggravated accuracy assessors. These are the kids who want to redo the work over and over and over again until it's perfect and sometimes will fail to turn it in at all because they're so busy trying to redo it. They'll erase and erase and erase and erase. They never met a form of whiteout they didn't love. Um, these are the ones for whom the whiteout tape is nirvana. Like they just love it because you can use it and you can write right over it right away. You don't have to blow on it and wait for it to dry. It's like they love it. In fact, these kids, I really do believe also, tend to really like office supplies of all kinds. And my husband says I became a teacher because I like office supplies. And I think that that's probably a little bit true because when we got married, I was very upset when I found out that Staples didn't have a bridal registry. <laughs> Risk evaders are another form of perfectionists. Risk evaders are the ones who say, if I can't do it perfectly the very first time, I don't even want to try it. And that, that is actually quite dangerous. And I'm going to talk about that in a little bit. Controlling image managers are pretty similar to risk evaders, but what controlling image managers say is, I could have it if I wanted it, but I'm pretending I don't want it. These are the ones who say, well, if I'd tried out for the school play, I could have had the lead, but I didn't even bother trying out. So they're the ones who act as if they don't care in order to mask how much they do care and yet are afraid they can't be perfect at it and that will destroy everyone's image of them as being perfect. So they have to control that image of perfection and they do that by pretending not to want things they really want. Procrastinating perfectionists are some of the most frustrating perfectionists for parents and educators. These are the kids who say, I'm, they have this weird math in their heads that says that a zero for not turning in work is not as bad as an 80 if you actually turned it in, right? Because an 80 shows that you tried 
and yet you only got an 80. Whereas a zero for not turning it in, the possibility is that if you had turned it in, you still would have gotten 100. And so they put it off and put it off and put it off. Another side of that are the kids who wait until, like they've had a project that they've been supposed to be working on for three weeks, which what that means is start the night before. That's like code for kids for start the night before. And they wait until the last minute so that they can turn it in and say to people, well, I got a 90, but I didn't even start working on it until 10 o'clock at night the night before. I mean, if I'd, if I'd been working on it for three weeks, I would have got 100. So they, the procrastinating perfectionists hide behind their procrastination in order to attack their perfectionism. So here are some of the consequences, and these are all pretty negative consequences. The biggest one you see I have is stress. This type of perfectionism, all of these types of perfectionism, cause tremendous stress, not just for the perfectionistic child, but also all of the adults in his or her circle. It's, it's very frustrating, it's very stressful, it's it, all of these words. But there are other negative consequences that come along with it, and I think you're all familiar with them. The risk avoidance is one, and we need our gifted kids to take risk. I mean, we need risk to be taken if pro progress is to be made. Nobody moves forward by repeating the steps that have been done before. And the people who are going to make progress are the people who have gift and talent and willing to work. And so when you put all that together, that's what moves people forward. That's what moves technology. That's what moves art. That's what moves everything is risk. They can become workaholics, which also can affect the word right below that, or phrase right below that, which is decreased social acceptance. It's hard to like them for long periods of time. I mean, it's annoying. If, if somebody next to you, if you're a kid and you have a friend who's a perfectionist about all, everything, then it can be very stressful to be the friend, because then you feel like if you're not a perfectionist, you're somehow, you've been, you know, examined and found wanting, that maybe you should be a perfectionist too. And that lends its own stress. It creates fear, fear of being found out, fear of that you're never going to be good enough, which of course, if you want to be perfect, that's a reasonable fear, because you never will be perfect. And ironically, can actually create underachievement, because as I said, sometimes they will not turn something in, rather than turn in something that isn't perfect. And so they can end up with a lot of anxiety, low self-esteem, a lot of problems. So. What's interesting though, is that perfectionism is not a dichotomy. It's not, you're either a perfectionist or you're not. It's a continuum. And it's not an unhealthy continuum until you reach the end. It's like a lot of things in life. You know, it's okay to have one Hershey's candy bar, but it's not okay to have 500. It's, well maybe over a lifetime it's okay. I, uh, my doctor recently told me that any chocolate over 70% cocoa is really medicine. And I just, one more reason why I love this doctor. And so, you, perfectionism doesn't always have to be a problem. And let me share with you when it's not. It can be healthy. So we want to ask these questions about the behaviors that we're seeing. First of all, is the child capable of relaxing? Can the child say, you know what, this just isn't worth all this stress. I've done it as well as I can. If I get a B, I get a B. Can they do that? Is the child's work mastery rather than grade oriented? Now, what that means is, can the child say, you know, I thought I was going to get an A on it, I got a B, but I learned a lot from doing it and I know what I did that I could do differently next time. And I, so I'm okay with that. If a child can say that, if a child says, I learned from it so the grade is secondary, then that's okay. When the child cannot articulate the worth of the assignment or the work other than through someone else's eyes, through the grade, then, that, then that's a problem and you'll see that. Next. Are the child's standards based on personal desire as opposed to outside pressure? So if the child is feeling pressure from parents or teachers, I'll, I'll tell you it's very rarely comes from teachers, but if the child's feeling pressure from an outside source to be perfect, that is a problem. And that leads to eating disorders and other manifestations of extreme stress. 
does the child receive pleasure from working hard? Like they enjoy it. Do they actually kind of feel good when they're working hard? I mean, we all have things that are passionate, passions for us, that if we're working on, it doesn't even feel like work, where you look up at the clock and think, oh, and, and that I'll, I'll talk about a little bit later, but it's part of Csikszentmihalyi's work on flow, and that feeling where your challenge is perfectly matched to your ability, and you get in the groove of it, and time just flies by. Are they receiving pleasure from that work, or is it unpleasurable? Is it displeasure? Is it agony? So the correct answer to all of those questions is yes. If you can answer yes to all of those questions, the perfectionism isn't a problem. It isn't really, in a sense, perfectionism at that point. It's the seeking for excellence, which I'll talk about. So but perfectionism can be unhealthy. And the questions that go along with that are these. Is a child motivated by low self-esteem? Does the child feel like, I'm not worthy of love or acceptance the way that I am, but if I were perfect, then you would love me? Is the child incapable of relaxing or letting go? But you can, I, I've seen this so many times, it's disturbing. When a child is tense, physically tense, I can't, it, it's two o'clock in the morning, literally two o'clock in the morning, child's like, I can't get it, it's not done, it's not right, this isn't, and what happens is they can't get the image of what they want to create from their head onto the paper. There's a disconnect there between what they think and what they can produce, and that creates high anxiety. Is the child unsatisfied, even with a very high level of effort, right? The child brings home a report card, the lowest grade is a 96, and like, but I know I could have got a 98, right? That, that's a problem. Are the child's feelings based on external evaluation? When I was teaching and I taught third grade, and then I taught third grade at the school where my own children were attending, and I got really nervous about my, one of my kids' ability to function at the secondary school without proper supervision. And so I became certified to teach high school and moved. They loved it. They were so happy that I was there with them. And I taught every single one of my children as their teacher. And they loved that too. But in any event, one day, one of my sons, one of my own personal children, I was teaching AP Comparative Government, which is political science. And he turned in this project, and I said, well, how do you think you did on it? And he said, I don't know, you tell me. I said, that's a problem, because you should have a really good feel for what this work is worth. You should have a really good feel for how, what it deserves and, and what you did without hearing from me. And then, of course, he had to explain that it was all just a joke. He couldn't care less what I thought. So <laughs> he was 17. So the correct answer to those questions is no, right? You want those answers to be no. So the key to this is there's a difference between perfectionism and the pursuit of excellence. And the pursuit of excellence is just fine and highly encouraged. The pursuit of perfectionism is like the Borg resistance, futile, right? You're, you're never gonna do that. So what is excellence? Excellence is that you're willing to be wrong. You'll never be truly excellent at anything until you're willing to be wrong. It means embracing risk taking. People who are excellent in their field take risks. It means feeling empowered and feeling powerful about what you do, not in the sense of arrogance, but in the sense of I can do a good job and in the sense of I'm not worried about the fact that I'm not going to be worth anything if I don't do a perfect job. It's feeling confident and it's allowing some spontaneity where, you know, your kid comes home from school and says, there's this lady who's coming to talk tonight and my teacher said you should go. And you say, oh, okay. That's, that's fine. When you say, I can't, I can't do anything because I have to do this, 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 this. I'm, I'm over scheduled and perfectly scheduled and rigid. It's a problem. Perfectionism is I have to be right. Being wrong is the absolute worst thing I could be. I'm scared. I'm scared somebody's going to find out I'm not perfect. I'm scared I never will be perfect. I'm scared not only will I not be perfect, but secretly I will never even be acceptable. I'm angry and I'm frustrated all the time because I can't get myself to perform in the way that I expect myself to perform. I'm trying to control everything around me. It's not working. I feel judgmental of myself and everyone else around me. And I'm under extreme pressure and self-doubt. 
Okay, so now you're all thinking, I'm so glad we came to this uplifting presentation. I feel so happy inside now. So let me share some big ideas and some specific techniques for what you can actually do if you feel like maybe your child is, or yourself, a little bit more on the perfectionism side of the continuum than the pursuit of excellence side. So the first big idea is that excellent is good enough. We've really got to model this for our kids, that excellent is good enough, that we ourselves are not always seeking anything better than the A minus, right? The house doesn't have to be perfect. The, the dinner doesn't have to be perfect. Our own job performance doesn't have to be perfect. Recently, I got a um, job you know, performance review at work, and, um, and you know, it was fine. But it wasn't perfect. My, um, the executive director of Mensa told me she doesn't actually believe in giving anyone all outstandings, which is fine with me. Um, and so, but I came home and I stuck it on the fridge because I wanted my kids to see that I may, you know, I may go travel around. People, you know, I fly around and talk to people, but I'm not perfect, and it's okay. So an A minus is fine. We don't always have to be going for an A plus. You know, the irony is, as she mentioned, my youngest son just got this big, huge scholarship. And interestingly, he is the lowest performer of all my kids. I mean, the other two, you know, perfect grades, per literally perfect grades, national merit scholars, everything. And yet he got the big money. And I think part of it was because he let himself live a life. Whereas my other two were very much focused on school, sometimes to the exclusion of a lot of other things. And my oldest son, definitely to the exclusion, like he, he never went on a date in high school. Now he had a reason. One day I said to him, Gregory, why don't you ever go on a date? He said, Mom, I'm not gonna marry any of these girls, so why would I waste money on someone else's wife? <laughs> could not argue with that logic. <laughs> so what we want to do is encourage excellence and mastery as opposed to perfection. So we, we ask kids this, well, so this, this is how you did on this? How do you feel about that? Did you learn something? Do you feel like you really understand how to do this? Could you do it again in a different form? If you saw this in a different form, could you do it? One of the techniques that I share is to assign tasks a level between one and five. Now a one means it just needs to get done. Those little pillows are optional. So at my house, I want beds to be made. I, they don't have to be perfect. I don't care if somebody's going to put the bed on Pinterest. You know, I don't need like a picture of the bed on the internet because it looks so good. But I want it to be made. That's a one. It just has to be done. It doesn't have to be done perfectly. A five means you're literally you're operating on my dog. Like something really important is at stake. So that's a five. Now the difficulty is that most perfectionists think that everything is a five. They think everything is a five. When in actuality really most things are about a three. And so if when I'm teaching, if I have a perfectionist student in my class, I actually write the number that I think the task is. I mean, really, math facts practice is like a two because it needs to be done and you want to get them right. But it really, does it have to be done perfectly? Does it have to take three hours to do 15 problems? No, it's, it's not a five. I think that this one strategy, it, Behind the idea behind that lies almost all of the answer because we overestimate the value of assignments. That's perfectionism. We overestimate the value of each individual thing. So in the handout, there is a, a Greek poet, Constantine Kavafi, wrote a poem called Ithaca. And it's about um, Odysseus. And how he, he, you know, the story in the Odyssey where he fights in the Trojan War and then he's trying to get back home to his island home of 
Ithaca. And all the way there, like it takes so much longer to get back home than it ever took to fight the war. It takes him like 20 years. And we all know the stories, right? He, he gets caught in the Scylla Crebdis and the Cyclops, Poseidon, um, he, the sirens, and his men have to tie him to his mask, and then the mast, and then the, um, his men kill the sun god's cattle, which the sun god frowns upon, and all this stuff, and the which Circe keeps him as her little slave um, in a cave for seven years, which my ninth grade student boys never could understand why that was a problem. And so it, the, all this bad stuff happens and then he gets home and all he wants to do is get home. All he wants to do is get home. And it takes forever and he feels like everything is just like you're having a dream where you're running, like you're trying to run and something's chasing you you can't move. Like that's his whole experience for 20 years and he's trying to get home and he feels like he, he isn't making any progress. And when he gets home, what does he find? Well, all these guys are there hitting on his wife. His son is a teenager and all angsty. And his dog is there, takes one look at him and kills over dead. I mean, it didn't turn out to be as great as he thought it was going to be. And Tennyson wrote a great poem about that. Like about here I am sitting on this island and I got this sun and I got all these people, savages, that's what he calls them. And what Cavafy says though is at the, at the end of the poem, well at the very beginning, as you set out for Ithaca, hope the voyage is a long one. Right, you're, you're, the journey is what it's about. And that is the whole essence of the poem. What he says at the end is, and if you find her poor, Ithaca won't have fooled you. Wise as you will have become, right? You will understand what these Ithacas mean. And for too many perfectionist kids, school is the Cyclops and Circe and angry Poseidon and the Scylla and Charybdis. And they think that their real life, their Ithaca, will come after they graduate. And what we need them to understand is that this is their real life, right? The journey right now they should be enjoying. They shouldn't be living their life right now for what their future is going to be exclusively, right? We, obviously they need to care about their future. I'm not saying don't care about your future. But you can't live in the future. You have to live your life and enjoy your life. So, you know, I don't normally actually mention this, but I will mention this. So I have these three sons, but I had a daughter, and, and, and she died. And so I will say that I know from personal experience that you have to live your life in the present because you don't, you're not guaranteed a future. You're guaranteed right now. And we have to teach our kids to enjoy their right now. The truth is, it's the journey, and it always was. So what are some strategies? And I was actually talking with your assistant superintendent before that there are some great books, some great research being done actually by Carol Dweck and her, her book Mindset and by Angela Duckworth down the road at the University of Pennsylvania on, on grit and this whole idea of determination and perseverance and stick with itness that is key. We have to teach kids, don't give up really easily. What, what I love in Angela Duckworth's research paper on grit. And normally, normally research is a little bit dry. Like you read the study and then you make your own interpretation. Unusual for this type of research, she actually had advice. And what she said is, we have to teach kids to work with stamina, not just intensity. And our get to kids are super good at intensity. And not always quite so good at the stamina. And we want to help them with stamina. Now, there's a caveat to this. Although the kids do need to develop these traits, and they can do that by engaging in long-term projects, things that take long periods of time to develop and develop well. We can help them do that through reading and hearing about people who have these kinds of traits. And in your handouts, you have these books I recommend on this. But I also suggest sharing with them biographies of people who had grit and determination. And easy places to look for this are biographies of polar explorers. I mean, Shackleton, and if you want to get a little bit more controversial, Robert Falcon Scott and Roald Amundsen, and their races for the South Pole. Admiral Byrd and flying over both poles. There are great, great stories of grit and perseverance. Now, Another big idea is we have to help kids not be their own worst enemy. Because although the following quote is true, and I'm a huge Vince Lombardi fan, I actually had this as a big poster in my classroom. The harder you work, the harder it is to surrender, which is true. This is also true. 
We must teach kids goal disengagement. We must teach kids when it is appropriate to disengage from a goal and reorient to another one because there literally will be no crossing this bridge when you come to it. So as much as you would want to keep walking across that bridge, it's not going to happen. And we have to teach kids how to disengage from inappropriate goals. I get very nervous when I hear parents say, well, he said he wanted to play soccer, and by golly, he is going to play on the World Cup team. I mean, I did not raise a quitter. Well. How are you ever going to find out what you want to do if you don't get the opportunity to explore it without feeling that you married it? I, there are some people, yeah, anyway, okay, I, won't, I don't want to offend anybody, so I'll stop. That's not quitting, it's common sense, right? If something's not working for you, then reorient yourself. And, and that's the next step. We have to teach re-engagement. So are we going to say, oh, okay, you can quit everything and just lie in your room with headphones on playing video games? No, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is if a goal isn't working for you, then find a different goal. You know, when Ernest Shackleton was headed for the South Pole on his aptly named Endurance vessel and it was crushed by ice and went to the bottom of the sea, which is not what you're really looking for when you're trying to get to the South Pole, um, he reoriented the goal. His goal changed from being getting to the South Pole to being getting his men out alive. And in a land literally littered with the bodies of dead explorers, he did just that. He rescued every single one of his men. And so reorienting yourself, finding a new goal is a key strategy. We need to teach kids how to avoid self-talk mistakes. Now, we model what we, want, what we want kids to hear. So we should not be saying things like, I'm so stupid, I can't believe I can't do this, if that's not what we want to hear our kids say when they get frustrated. So think about if you're driving, and I know that in this beautiful area, probably nobody would ever like cut you off on the road, but where I live, people do that. And you wanna make sure that when those kind of stresses come to you in your life, that your kids don't hear just frustration and anger, but they rather hear how you are going to solve the problem. So we talk through, you know, well, we were going to do this. However, we had this setback. So we're going to try this, and if it doesn't work, then we're going to try that. Or if somebody cuts us off, we say, wow, you see how if somebody cuts me off, I have to slam on my brakes to avoid hitting them. That's kind of dangerous, right, rather than profanity. Okay. So. Not that that would ever happen. We want to develop an ask, don't tell policy. And what I mean by that is nobody likes being told how to feel. So we don't want to tell our kids, you should be happy with this, or you should feel good about this, or you should feel bad about the fact that you're frustrating your parents. When you tell somebody how to feel, even if that actually is how they feel inside, they're going to rebel against your telling them that they feel that way. And like every woman in the room is nodding and elbowing her husband, right? yes, don't tell me how I feel. So, but the truth is, is that even very young children don't like to be told how to feel. So we need to ask them, so how did that make you feel? And how did you handle those feelings? Like what did you do with them? We need to model our own strategies for dealing with stress because like chewing pencils is not the only stress relief strategy. So I, when I was teaching, I would actually tell the kids, you know, I, I, to reduce stress in my life, I do yoga. So if anybody wants to do yoga with me at lunch, I'm in here. And I had a core group of students who would come in and do yoga with me every day at lunch. And um, I would tell them, or, you know, I just really need a piece of like 90% chocolate right now. Or whatever your stress reduction strategy is. Even breathing and letting them see you. Like, my kids knew this is a joke in my family, but I would say, I need to go for my, to my happy place for just a moment. And I just close my eyes and breathe in. And every now and then, one of my other kids will walk in while I'm doing it and be like, what'd you do? Mom's in her happy place, right? What'd you do? You must have done something. So we have to model strategies for dealing with stress. We are not born knowing how to handle the kinds of stress that we encounter. We have to teach our kids how to do it. 
So Nike has something just right, and that is the idea that you've got to just do it. One of the issues with perfectionists is they, they will just keep doing the same thing over and over and not want to turn it. There's no need to spend 20 hours on a single assignment because even a tea party gets old after all, right? In Alice in Wonderland and the Mad Hatter, has, it's always 6 o'clock because the Queen of Hearts got mad at him. So when I was reading this book to my kids, they thought it would be a really good idea. They didn't believe me when I said, you know, it gets old after a while. They didn't believe me. And so I was like, okay, fine. We'll eat nothing but cake. And then we'll see how long that lasts. Three and a half weeks later. Three and a half weeks later. My husband and I are like driving down to the grocery store to sneak apples. And so, you know, but after three and a half weeks, finally, the kids were like, can we please have a salad? Right. And they got it after a while. But the truth is, is that we have to teach our kids, you know, you don't want to, you don't want to eat the same assignment. You want to, you want to do it, do a good job, move on. Do the job it deserves. That's the key. Do the job it deserves. You don't want to turn schoolwork into this, that Groundhog Day movie, you know, where he wakes up and he has to live the day over and over and over again. In French, the movie was called A Day Without End. And I think some kids see it as like an assignment without end. So, there's an assistant principal in a school in Kansas, and she had a sign in her classroom, and I loved it when she was a teacher. Work is never done, it's just do. Just do it. That's what we need to teach kids. The work will never be done. It will never be perfect. You'll never get it exactly how you want it. Just like any other thing, you know? But it's just do. Okay, so do you guys remember these toys? Weevils and bozos? And so this is the nice thing about these toys. They both have a similar quality. In fact, it's their whole reason for being is that they fall down, and then what do they do? They come back up, right? They come back up. It turns out that having a fat round bottom is a really good thing. <laughs> so what we want is to teach our kids, you are essentially a weevil. You were designed to be knocked down and come back up again. In fact, in both of those toys, weevils and bozos, you fall down, and in the falling, you're already, the momentum is bringing you back up. Now, I know that that's physics, but what it really is, is the antidote to perfectionism. It's teaching kids, anytime you're knocked down, you're, that is your job, and then you just come right back up. Don't stay down, because that's what weevils do. Weevils wobble, but they don't. You all know the song, right? Weevils wobble, but they don't. Right. All of you, you want to sing it. I know you do. And so it's true. And we need to help our kids see that humans were designed to be weebles and bozos. We were designed to get knocked down and come right back up. We want to teach them that. They, we want to teach them that the getting back up is part of the same motion, that rock back motion. So we also can teach them that resilience is ordinary magic, that every single person can find in their own challenges resilience. So this is Alex, and she was diagnosed with childhood cancer, and she decided that rather than sit around feeling sorry for herself, she would raise money for childhood cancer research, and so she set up a lemonade stand. Now, the cancer eventually took her life, but Alex's lemonade stand has raised $45 million for childhood cancer research. So that's just ordinary magic, that's resilience. You're faced with something bad, and you can literally make lemonade. The next big idea is that sometimes failure is a perfectly acceptable option. Now, um, in case any of you are interested, the link to this presentation, this presentation is public and online, and the link to it is in your handout. So, um, in any event, I hate to hear people say failure is not acceptable, because it's only by failing that we develop and really grow. If you are too scared to fail, you'll never really do anything of value. Now, I'm not talking about global failure. I'm not talking about, you know, letting your kid live at your house at the age of 35, just eating your food and playing video games. That's not what I'm doing. I'm talking about. I'm talking about instance, individual instances of non-success. So we have to teach kids how to fail forward. This is the kind of the vernacular right now. It's learning to fail forward. Failing, but falling a little bit more forward when you do it. So this, um, and I actually have this in the handout too, there's a website called Big Huge Labs, and you can make these motivational posters, 
and you can make really ironic, snarky, sarcastic, funny ones too. But this was one I made to hang in my classroom, and it has a line from Star Wars in it, and Yoda says, lost a planet, Obi-Wan has. How embarrassing. Because I wanted to say to kids, when they were coming and say, I can't do it, I can't get it right, I would say, did you lose a planet? No, okay, well, then you're better than the Jedi, right? Because Obi-Wan lost a planet. So we have to help kids see that no matter how badly they feel about what they've done right then, many people have done many worse things. Like there's been tremendous failure going on. Everybody who's ever done anything of value has failed at something. Everybody who's ever won a Nobel Prize has had tremendous failure. I think that I want to hear. I want the Nobel Prize for like most ambitious failure, you know, most incredible failure. So these, these lessons on perfectionism um, have been hard, hard won for me. I, I'm kind of a, came, I'm a perfectionist. I was, and I've had to let it go in order to live in harmony with my family. And when I was um, in college though, I was an English major and I um, really felt that there was no grade other than 100 available. And so I was taking an American literature class and I knew that I was gonna do well in it because that's my shtick. And I come in class and the very first day the professor says, by the way, I don't give 100s. And of course I thought to myself, I'm gonna make him give me 100, you know? And so the very first test comes and I knew I had it in the bag and I get it back and it was a 99. So I'm at his office hours, knock, knock, knock. Why do I have a 99? And he patiently, bless his heart, explains to me how I could have gone deeper in a couple of places, examples I could have used. Blah, blah. Next test, I was so ready. I was like reciting it in the shower. I could have taught it. I could have written a dissertation with my preparation for this test. I come in 99. All semester, it goes like this. Five exams, 99, 99. Final exam, I give him a self-addressed stamped envelope. I want this exam back in the mail. I knew it was my moment, right? It was like my Sally Field, you like me, you really like me moment at the county I'm going to get 100. I get it back in the mail. Guess what it was? A 99. Right, it was a 99. So the next semester, I go to his office hours. I'm like, OK, seriously, what's going on? And he said, well, you know, he said, I could have easily given you 100 on that very first exam. But your 99s at the end of the semester were so much better than your 99s at the beginning of the semester. And if I had given you 100, you wouldn't have gone anywhere. And so we have to use that idea. If you get 100 right away, you leave no room for growing. And what we want is growing. So, okay, so this is perfect, because I'm like in college, I was driving down this like quilt shop. So, I decided to learn how to quilt because my sister-in-law was getting married, and I wanted to make her a quilt. It, truthfully, she wasn't really worth it, I'll tell you, honestly, but I decided I wanted to make her a quilt. And so, my friend was teaching me how to quilt, and I kept making all these mistakes. And I make this mistake, and, sh and she would say, don't worry about it, that's just your Amish mistake, you know, and the Amish make quilts, they make a mistake on purpose, because only God is perfect, blah, blah, blah. So I meet this Amish quilter at a quilt show, and she's like, that is such bunk. That we don't do that, we make enough mistakes on accident, we don't have to put in a mistake on purpose, you know, you English. So um, then, uh, but then I did meet a quilter who said in her, family, how she'd been taught was they did put in what they call the God block, that they put in wrong on purpose. But whenever my kids would make a mistake and then I try to teach myself, when I make a mistake, I say, oh, that's just my honest mistake. That's just my mistake, my mistake that I'm using to prove I'm not perfect and don't think I should be. So we can teach kids, you know, just to use that vernacular, oh, it's your honest mistake. It's okay. Because the truth is, no one is perfect. Although I really did see some really beautiful quilts on my way today, really gorgeous. So we want to provide support in dealing with failure. In my classroom, and then my children saw this and wanted it home, so we ended up doing it at home. We had a my favorite mistake wall. And in my classroom, it started out being bad grades that they got in my class. But then it expanded. It expanded into bad grades that they got in other classes. 
And then other things. They take screenshots of their girlfriend breaking up with them on Facebook or whatever, and they put it up there. And every day when kids would come into the room, that would be the first place they would go, is their my favorite mistake wall. And they had an assignment in class to interview three adults and ask them what their favorite mistake was and what they had learned from it. Because the truth is, is that we all make mistakes, and very few of us wish that we never made mistakes. We can help kids practice predictions about outcome because a lot of times perfectionists feel like the whole world is against them in their quest for perfection, which basically is true. And that, you know, everything is such a tautology. You know, it's going to be terrible. And so we can help them say, okay, well, what's the worst possible thing that could happen? What's the best thing that could happen? And then what's the most likely thing? that will happen and help them see that their worst case scenario that they're working on is not the most likely outcome. Eeyore, said Al, Christopher Robin is giving a party. Very interesting, said Eeyore. I suppose they will be sending me down the odd bits which got trodden on. Kind and thoughtful, not at all. Don't mention it. Don't be Eeyore. We want to teach kids not to be Eeyore. You know, nobody who, like if you said, what character would you like to be in Winnie the Pooh? Nobody says Eeyore. Everybody wants to be Winnie the Pooh or Tigger or maybe Kanga or maybe Christopher Robin or Piglet. Maybe even like elephants and woozles. But nobody wants to be Eeyore. Why? Because nobody wants to be Eeyore and like that. So we have to teach your kids, everybody is not against you. Don't be Eeyore. And so that's code word in our house. You're being an Eeyore. You're acting like everybody's against you. We want to teach our kids, just jump. I don't know if any of you are like this, but there are two kinds of people in the world, the people who jump in the pool and the people who get in the steps, and then they get in to write about their abdomen, and then they can't go any further, and they're like tapping, like patting the top of the water, and people come by and splash them, and they're like, don't splash me. And the other person will be like, you're in a pool. I know, but I don't really want to get wet. I get it on my stomach. Okay. But we, we want to be the people who just jump in the pool. We want to just jump in sometimes. Don't worry if you can't dive perfectly. Don't worry if the water is a little bit cold. Don't stand in the shallow end forever, worried that you're not Michael Phelps. Right? Just jump in. Now, one of the things with perfectionism is that kids tend to steal other kids' problems. They get, where I'm from, we would say, all up in their business. They get involved in other people's business. They're very concerned about fairness. They're very concerned, like, that the teacher, what is the teacher doing with that kid? And is it exactly the same as what the teacher is doing with me? And so one of the strategies that we have to teach is you wouldn't steal a Gatorade from the grocery store, so why are you going to steal this other person's problem? You know, when you steal someone's problem, you steal their struggle. When you steal their struggle, you steal their ability to grow. So we don't want our kids stealing other people's problems. And that is, I would say, as a teacher, one of the biggest problems that we encounter, or that I've encountered with kids, kids is just their inability to mind their own business. And it's a perfectionist tendency. I'm going to be perfect, and I want everybody else to be perfect, and my teacher's going to be perfect, and she's going to perfectly handle all of this other stuff. And, and my idea of perfect is that it has to be all equal. Barbara Clark has a great model for problem resolution that works wonderfully with gifted kids. The first one is you ask, what happened? The second question is, what's the problem? I don't know if any of you have ever had this experience, but you ask, what happened? And the kid tells you, and you're like, and that's a problem because, <laughs> it's like, I don't see a problem here. So you ask him, what's the problem in this? What are you doing to solve the problem? So you're gonna focus on the action, right? The action of it. What are you doing? to solve the problem, rather than getting all tied up in the anxiety of the problem and worrying about it. What are you actually doing? And then you ask, is it working? Is what you're doing working? And then this, what are you willing, if the answer is no, what are you willing to do differently? Now, if the answer is yes, this is what I'm doing and it's working, then great, then you just provide support. If they say no, then you continue. What are you willing to do differently? And they may want to blame the other person. Yeah, that's not what's at issue here, because they don't have control over the other person. They have to ask, what are you willing to do differently? It's not working for you, so what are you willing to do differently? And then, again, this is that ask, don't tell. You want to say, would you like to hear 
what other kids have tried? Or would you be willing to? Not, well, you should. Rather than, well, if that's not working, then you should do this. But would you like to hear? Would you like some ideas? Oh, I had that happen to me when I was your age. Would you like to know how I solved it? And you may have to repeat those steps again and again and again. Voltaire said, the perfect is the enemy of the good. And I truly believe this. One of the things that stands the most in the way of our gifted kids' success, in the way of their goodness, is an unreasonable quest for perfectionism, that if we can intervene and circumvent, then we can help them to achieve what they really can be, which is amazing, outstanding, happy, happy individuals, rather than anxiety-ridden children who can't enjoy their beautiful and amazing lives because they're so worried about trying to be perfect. I would also say that this holds true for overscheduling our children, that the perfect um, can be the enemy of the good, in the sense that there are a lot of good things in the world that our kids can participate in, and more good things than they possibly could ever participate in. And if we try to put them into too many of those things at one time, then we can create some of the same anxiety that exists in the search for perfectionism.